You see, Fernando, we lost, we lost participants, but we found the model. No, we lost Fernando too. Fernando, well, whatever. So is Rowan here? Now it starts. Hey, he is. Yes. Rowan. Hey, I am just silent, finally. Alice. I am silent, not absent. You are, you are silent, but did you see? Maybe we found the model. Yes. Good. They didn't mean to be on plasma, but. Okay, good. Uh, oh, we have no one at the, in the end. So should we go to the last talk of our own? Or are there any more questions for Marco? Are there uh, more questions? Yeah. So uh, otherwise we, uh, we go for the last talk and then uh, we see if there is a question, or there is some discussion uh, later on, okay? So finally, we have Rowan. <laughs> Rowan, are you ready? Can you share the screen? Yeah. No, please, what's your face? Hey, hi, nice to hi. meet you. <laughs> um, okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes. 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 Okay, great. So you have 15 minutes. Yeah, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, I had a weird, crazy week, and, and uh, it was been kind of a mess. And I made two different time zone mistakes uh, that uh, uh, messed up uh, my previously two previously scheduled talk slots. So I really appreciate the organizers for being very flexible and generous. And I'm really sorry for all the inconvenience I've caused. And thanks for bearing with me. And uh, anyways, here I am to do this talk finally. So. Uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to find uh, interactions between genes in accessory genomes using their uh, using patterns of gene gain and loss using presence and absence um, or presences and absences of genes and uh, so this uh, so, so very closely related to what uh, James McInerney presented earlier about Cohen Finder and what his group is doing. So. Uh, for instance, if we if we take and I apologize for coming into a plasmid workshop and immediately throwing up some linear genomes, but anyways, so here's uh, here's four examples of, of genomes that we've got these um, uh, different colored uh, genes. Of these these solid uh, solid colored genes are, are part of the accessory genome of these organisms, and so you can see this pattern of, of blue and yellow. These genes appear in um, when they appear, they appear together. Well, they don't appear, they, they don't appear together. And so that's one potential signal of an interaction between these two genes. In this case, it would be a, uh, uh, what I would call a positive interaction in that they either help each other or are required for each other's uh, effect. And then uh, with this green and, and, and yellow or the green and blue genes, we can see that the green gene is present when the other genes are absent and it's absent when the other genes are present. And so that would be a signal potentially of some sort of negative interaction where it's either an alternative or a um, or a competitive gene, and so so there have been uh, there's many methods that that try to, to detect uh, um, intera gene interactions using these presence absence uh, patterns, and so what I was trying to do is trying to come up with a method that works for extremely or like on the order of thousands to ten to tens of thousands of um, samples because this is an example tree that I'll show later based on the database that I was using, but um, a, a lot of, a lot of time, oftentimes when you need to do coevolution stuff, you need to look at, uh, you need to look at the tree at least and, and try and, and often for, perform computations across the whole tree. And when the trees get really big, then um, this gets uh, computationally intensive. It's very slow. And, uh, and so the, the solution that I had for this is let's, uh, we'll throw out, let's throw out most of the tree. Let's only look at the, the thing that we think, that I think, um, will be the, the strongest signal of genetic interaction in these accessory genomes, which is uh, whether or not there's differences between like the most closely related samples, a pair of samples in the data set. So in general, uh, if you have closely related samples, you don't expect them to differ very much. And if they do differ, that's interesting. And then if they differ in the same way for different genes, that's even more interesting and potentially tells us something about those genes. So here's an example of three um, three sets of pairs of individuals. 
Uh, the here, this, this a pair of closely related individuals here, they, these, these uh, individuals are identical. And here, in this pair of individuals, one individual has these two genes, the other individual doesn't. And so what that would do is, if, if I see this pattern, I chalk that up to one, I, I tally that up uh, for, uh, for one, one point in the positive interaction store between the blue and yellow genes. And if something looks like this with, with these two closely related individuals, where one of the individuals has the blue gene and doesn't have the yellow gene, whereas the other individual doesn't have the blue gene and has the yellow gene, then I chalk that up as a point for a negative interaction between these two genes, blue and yellow. And then so I do that for every single uh, pair of closely related individuals in the data set and come up with a, a positive or negative interaction score for each pair of genes. Now, so I applied this method to a database collected by uh, collaborators at Emory University, Robert Pettit and Tim Reed, who compiled about 40,000 publicly available Staph aureus genomes into this nice uh, database called Staphopia. And so I applied a, a, my method to uh, both um, subsets and the whole data set here. And, uh, and this, is just, this is that tree that I showed earlier. This, this is just the tree of, of the samples. So I applied my method to, to these samples. And this is the, the, the main result is like, this is, this, this is the network of strongest interactions between genes in uh, this database of Staph aureus. And so the, there's a couple of take home messages from these results here. First, um, most of the strong interactions are either, they're the color, this red color here, which uh, is uh, signifies in, the color scheme I was using, virulence related genes. So all these genes either code for some sort of toxin or some biofilm formation for host colonization or um, something else that involves, that, that is related to uh, infection of the host with Staph aureus. And so there's a couple of clusters of those virulence genes. Um, and then there's also uh, the other prominent feature of this network is uh, clusters of antibiotic resistance genes uh, or antibiotic resistance genes in general, in particular, this cluster here of, of um, which is a uh, SEC MEC, the, the cassette that's the primary driver of methicillin resistance in Staph aureus. So all those are interacting with each other. Then there's also other antibiotic resistance genes. Here's some more beta lactam resistance genes. Um, and then we see that they're, they're interacting with these cadmium resistance genes, which uh, reflects a known uh, plasmid interaction um, there. And then there's a couple of other, here this is a phosphomycin resistance gene, and this is a, um, another antibody resistance gene. So the primary things that are happening in recent co genetic uh, gene presence absence co-evolution in Staph aureus are primarily driven by the host pathogen interaction, whether it be virulence or resistance to antibiotics. Um, and then it's all clearly obviously driven by the source of gene transfer. And we see um, certain genes like REP and REP A and, and uh, my, my Zoom thing is blocking one thing those, but I think it's pre. These are pl plasmid related genes. So, uh, right. So, um, the the line type here, the dash, the solid line indicates this is a positive interaction, and the dashed line indicates that's a negative interaction. And uh, as you can see, that most of the lines here are, are, are solid, which means there's a positive interaction, this co presence or co absence. Um, and the reason. Uh, or, and, and so this is a consistent pattern across the entire data set. So this is here I've split up the data set into various different clonal complexes, which are uh, a higher taxonomics uh, a level of, for Staph aureus than the sequence type. And so there's, and, um, and then on the y-axis is the fraction of the interactions uh, that, uh, that are detected by my method that are positive. And so you can see that across the board, the majority of interactions are positive. Um, which suggests that these that these accessory genes through horizontal gene transfer are um, coming together into uh, groups of genes that that um, work together, and then the, the, and the, that's the dynamic sort of driving this process. And this result is um, consistent with previous results uh, seen uh, using different methods in different species, like E. coli with with a uh, uh, cone finder. Okay, and so now this is a network of, so the previous network was the strongest set of interactions in the whole data set. This is a network of the interactions that are consistent, uh, the strong and consistent across all the clonal complexes 
in the data set. And so same similar story, you can see there's fewer virulence related genes here and more, more resistance related genes. Um, and then uh, some, and then the mobile genetic element genes are um, still here. And so that's that, that suggests that, that the virulence evolution might be more environmentally specific, whereas the uh, resistance evolution is, uh, is consistent across the whole um, set of Staph aureus genomes. So you can also do this with, uh, you don't have to do this with, with gene presence absence. You could also do a, a binary trait, uh, any sort of binary trait. So, they have, so anything you can code with a one or a zero, uh, you can apply this method to. And so for instance, so here I, I apply this to predicted antibiotic resistance phenotypes instead of uh, specific gene presence absences in the same data set. And on the x-axis uh, here, uh, or on, sorry, in the lower triangle of this, Correlation matrix here is the score that you get, the co-evolution score you get using my method, and then the upper triangle here is just a straight up presence, a correlation between the presence absence uh, vectors of these antibiotic resistance phenotypes. And so, in ge so generally, most of these results uh, are um, uh, sort of uh, the the patterns are mostly the same. Except, so, in general, we can see this. There's this one big cluster of uh, uh, particular antibiotic resistances that tend to uh, co uh, have positive interactions and co-occur with each other. They're driven by, or they're, they're centered on the beta-lactam resistances, including the uh, SCC MEK complex for that one, the cetracyclines, aminoglycosides, and MLS as well. And then the less common, and, and these are also the, by far the most common antibiotic resistances present in the data set. And the less common ones tend to form a sort of peripheral cluster, which has high correlation, but um, they don't actually have much of a recent evolutionary signal suggesting that these uh, antibiotic resistances, um, the relationships are due to earlier splits or, or earlier events on the tree that my method, which only looks at really close relatives, won't pick up. There it is specifically not supposed to pick up because um, I don't want to confound uh, the signal with phylogenetic effects. And the other interesting thing about this is that phosphomycin resistance appears to be negatively associated with all these other ones. And if we actually go back up to uh, this network here, you see this is a phosphomycin resistance gene and it has a bunch of negative interactions with a bunch of uh, the genes, uh, uh, other genes. So I don't know what's going on with phosphomycin, but, uh, but it's doing something different from everything else in, in this data set. Okay. So I sort of blitzed through that in an effort to save some time, but in summary, uh, I've made a method to detect genetic interactions um, in bacterial data sets on the order of thousands to tens of thousands of genomes. And uh, the, the thing about this method is it doesn't require a phylogenetic tree, it just requires a distance matrix um, and you don't have to traverse the tree all the time to, uh, to do anything with it. And uh, so we can see from the results that uh, the recent evolution of Staph aureus uh, in the accessory genome is primarily driven by host pathogen interaction, especially involving SCC MEK and, and virulence. But the majority of interactions are positive, which um, again uh, seems to concur with other uh, results in different systems. So maybe this is a, a general pattern of genome evolution in bacteria. And so there's a preprint available online. Um, and uh, the method that, that I'm currently writing in our package, uh, which is gonna be called decoder, detecting co volume traits using relatives, that should be available soon to enable this computation in general. Thanks for listening. These are my advisors and collaborators. And again, thanks for bearing with me for uh, my scheduling mishaps for this uh, workshop. Okay, thank you very much. So I see Simone,